right. Are you ready this morning? Yeah. Good, because I'm ready this morning, praise God. All right, go this morning to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Been talking about the kingdom of God, praise God. How many of you know you now belong in the kingdom of God? Yeah. You are citizens of a spiritual kingdom that is a good kingdom and also has a very good king. How many know the king's a pretty good guy? Yeah. Yes, he is, praise God. It's nothing like what we're living in government wise in the world at any time, basically. Okay, Psalm 24. We're going to show you some spiritual laws this morning that will help you. Psalm 24, look at verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein it. And he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, and has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doers, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of who? Glory. Hallelujah. Good psalm, huh? Amen. Notice now here, it's talking about a kingdom, basically, because it's talking about a king. How um, many you know the ruler of a kingdom happens to be a king? Here it talks about him being king and lord, because not only is he king, he's lord, he owns everything, including you, here in the earth right now. Here it tells you where he resides. He resides in the hill of the Lord, or in the holy place, or basically the throne of God. Now notice what it asks. Who can ascend unto this holy hill? Who can stand in his presence? Basically it says, who can have an audience with God? Well, who can? Somebody who has clean hands and a what? Pure heart. pure heart. So if I have clean hands and a pure heart, I can have an audience with God, with the king himself. But what if I don't have clean hands and I do not have a pure heart? I don't have an audience. Are you following me? Now, this is important in your prayer life, basically, because if you want prayers answered, this is the way they get answered, by you having a pure heart. If you don't have a pure heart, the Bible says in Psalm 66, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he does not hear me. Are you following me? Yeah. So there's no sense going to God if your heart isn't pure, because if it isn't pure, then God doesn't hear you anyway, and if he doesn't hear you, how many of you he's not going to answer? Now, the period he's talking about here, as it says before, when you do this, what will happen to you? First of all, you will start to receive. Say receive. receive. Notice you don't get, you receive the blessings of the Lord. And how many blessings did he give you? He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But that doesn't mean you're receiving those blessings. It just means they're there. And they belong to you, but you have to receive them. So how am I going to receive them? I'm going to receive them with a pure heart. I'm going to receive them with clean hands. That's the results of it. Notice what it says. Look at verse 5. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness. Say righteousness. righteousness. Now we know what righteousness is. This is what we've been looking at teaching on. Righteousness is basically your ability, right alignment with God, where you can come to the throne of God without any guilt, out any condemnation, out any inferiority, and you can stand with Him in the holy place to fellowship with Him. Amen. But it also basically gives you a position where you can go before the devil, sickness, and disease, and all his works with no guilt, inferiority, or as a victim, but as a winner. So righteousness is important, isn't it? To understand that, that I'm the righteousness of God makes a difference. So what is available from God the King, basically? God will hear you if you come to Him with clean hands and a pure, pure heart. Remember what the Bible says? The fervent prayer of any man... Yeah. Righteous. Huh? The fervent prayer of a righteous. So I want to be a righteous man. But in order to be a righteous man, I have to know how to be a righteous man. Or I'm going to try to be a righteous man through ways that I think are going to help make me righteous so that I have a pure heart before God. Are you following me? Let me tell you, the devil's a deceiver. If you get off into something stupid, he'll leave you there as long as he can. Because it's a spiritual law and it won't line up. So here it says, a pure heart and righteousness of God, you can ascend to God, you can have an audience with the king, you can come unto the king and basically receive any of the blessings that he gave you because they simply belong to you. All right, go to Acts 15. Let's 
it's going to be hard for you to really believe me, but there have been times in my Christianity and my walk of the kingdom where I prayed and it didn't work. <laughs> now, I know for all of you it works every single time, but I'm talking about me this morning. There's times it wasn't working. Well, I found out that if God promises it, and I ask for it, and I don't get it, that I just don't say, well, God just didn't want to do that today. He's just busy doing the no. There had to be something wrong. There, there had to be something missing. And I knew it wasn't Him. So I wasn't going to straighten Him out. I was going to have to straighten my self out. But once again, I was re raised in a denomination where I was taught that I was a sinner, unworthy, no good, couldn't do it. But notice, I thought I was praying, but I could not even ascend to the hill of God. Right. I wasn't even in the presence of God. God couldn't even hear me because I was guarding every iniquity regarding in my heart. I'm no good. Oh, Lord, I'm coming to you in prayer, and I really don't believe I deserve this, and I shouldn't have this, and you're probably not going to do it anyway, but I just want to let you... I mean, we were all there at one time, weren't we? Yeah. That's what we thought. That was that nature that was given to us until we got born again, and that nature got delivered out of the inside of us. All right, Acts chapter 15, look at verse 8. And God which knows the hearts, how many know he knows the hearts, yeah. bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did to us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? Okay, now, we want to have pure hearts, yes. We want to purify our hearts, so how do we do it? Do we purify our hearts by prayer? No. By fasting? No. By repentance? No. By giving money? No. Going to revival? No. Fighting bad habits our whole life? No. no. How do we get it? Faith. 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 By simply believing in what He has done for us and having faith in that purifies my heart. Amen. See? It don't matter how much works you do, it's not going to help in your purification process because you cannot buy this thing. It's already been provided. Are you listening? Yeah. It's like if you go to a foreign country and you show up over there and you want to buy something and you go in and you tell them you want to buy it and you put down $40 American money and they said, you, you can't buy that. We don't take American money here. They said, what do you take? Well, I take this or I take that. Well, I'll give you $80. Doesn't matter. You can't buy that thing there. Well, we do works, and if that doesn't work, you know what we do? We do $80 works. <laughs> if that doesn't work, we do $100 works. If that do be 120 But that currency doesn't work. Amen. See, it doesn't work. What works? Righteousness works. That's the only thing that works in the holy hill of God. That's the only thing that works for me in God. So, so I've got to change my thought life to line up with who He said I am and what He made me through the blood of Jesus. And basically by doing that, I get more audiences with God all the time. And He's ready to receive and give me the blessings of God that He's already provided for me. But He's not stopping it. We're stopping it. Yep. Are you following me? Yep. And it's a thought life that we got. Basically it does that. So we receive an audience with the King. We get to go to the throne room, but we do it by faith. Say by faith. Right. And faith is just not in anything. It's in the finished works of Jesus Christ. Not in what you think the finished works are. There's a lot of sermons out there about good views, but how many know we want the good news? Amen. Yeah, we want the good news, and that's in the Bible here. All right, go to Hebrews chapter 1. All right, Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse 8. But it says, But unto the Son, talking about Jesus Christ, He said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy what? Amen. Thou has loved righteousness, and thou has hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All right, here's, here's God. This is God talking. And what does God say? God says, basically, I respond to a scepter of righteousness. Now, what's a scepter? A scepter in the old days and spiritual days is when a king would sit on his throne, and you'd come in to have an audience with him, and if he took the scepter and he pointed it to you, you could talk. If he didn't pick up the scepter and point it to you, you better shut your mouth. Because if you don't, they're going to cut your head off probably before you get out of there. So it was important that the king saw somebody, pointed the scepter to him, and as soon as they did, you can have an audience. Well, now he's talking about a spiritual king, and he's talking about a spiritual scepter. What is that scepter? Righteousness. 
Are you following me? So he, he, when he points that scepter at you, you have an audience with God now. Your heart is pure. You've advanced to the holiest of holies. You've come to the throne room of God. You can ask what you want, and it will be done because it's God's will, and you know what God's will is. So you get answered prayer like this. You're not coming guilty anymore. You're not coming condemned anymore. You're not coming as a low life anymore. You're coming of who he made you as a new creation in Christ Jesus, and now you're walking in his presence on the same level. And how many know God wants you to come boldly to the so you're coming boldly. When you come boldly, you know who you are. He points that scepter at you and whoo hoo I know what God says. Healed, blessed, anointed, hallelujah, prosperous, glory. God says, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. But notice, he doesn't like iniquity. So when you're coming to him as a low life, as a sinful person, I mean, you can even see it. It's funny because you can even see it in the natural realm. When I was working at the post office, everybody knew who I was and what I stood for. I mean, when you're around people all the time, they know that. Well, if I'd come up to the time clock and I'd punch in and somebody come behind me and wanted to get the time clock and it changed before they got there, they would cuss. But they immediately looked at me and said, oh, I'm sorry for that. No, you don't have to be sorry that you cuss because I'm standing there. See, but they knew that they were out of line See? With an audience with me. So they just naturally said, boy, I mean, lined up with him and I wasn't very nice. And sometimes we go to God feeling like that. Yes. Oh, I sinned yesterday. I kicked my dog yesterday. Uh, I didn't leave my cat any food yesterday. I didn't. And we got all these low life things coming to God. But God doesn't want you to focus on your performance. He wants you to focus on his performance. And his performance is always good things. So this is why, hallelujah, this is why, We've had our whole church, 2,000 people in our church, praying for Brother Bill, praying for Brother Bill. And Bill died anyway. We had the whole church praying for him. But how many of them were actually getting through? See, it's not the number. We think the more people we get, God's finally going to listen. So if we get the 2,000 church here and the 4,000 church over here and the 2,000 church, God's going to have to do something because he's got 8,000 people on his back all the time. And he's going to have to make a decision. It doesn't work like that. It's a spiritual law. Are you following? So it doesn't matter how many people. You need to have the right people. That's why you need to know other people's hearts. See, God knows their hearts, but you can know their hearts. So whenever I need prayer, I go to people who I know have hearts who are going to get an audience who are going to get the scepter pointed to them in agreement with me so that it gets done are you following you don't want everybody to put it on facebook pray for brother joe i can imagine some of the prayers going up on facebook most of them are the folding hands just send that back don't ever pray anyway who cares hands are folded i did my job praise god brother joe is doing fine See, but this isn't a game. This is reality. You've got a king, for God's sakes, who wants to give you everything you want, but you have to get in line in order to receive everything you want, and you want to do that with a pure heart and go to the way with well, you go to way with God out of righteousness. Even though you're righteous, you may sin. How many know if you confess your sin, He's faithful and just? But if you don't confess it, how many as you stand there praying, forgive? If you don't want to give it, then you're still not in righteousness. Even though you're a righteous person, you're acting unrighteously. Are you following? So we want to know we're righteous, number one. And we want to act like righteous people, which you will do when you understand that you are. Because you'll catch yourself every time you step outside of righteousness. If you believe you're righteous, every time you take a wrong step, you say, oh my gosh, I'm doing something wrong. I mean, you don't have to do it. it just It's in here, ain't it? Uh, once you feel like somebody punched you in the stomach. And they didn't. That's just the Holy Ghost saying, what the heck are you doing now, praise God? I gave you a double red light stoplight and you drove right on through, praise God. <laughs> and if you do it often enough, you won't even look back. That was good. Yeah, you'll get conditioned to it. You just do it. Think that's all right. And then you're not receiving anything from God. You don't have an audience with God. And what's the matter with God? And what's the No, the problem isn't God ever. The problem is us. Amen. Amen. See, so what happens here? Now we want to go to the Holy Hill. So righteousness is a very important thing. Once again, because the fervent prayer of a... Righteous. Avails what? Right. Right. All right, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there's many scriptures in the Bible telling you that you are one with him. But hardly anybody preaches those scriptures because people get mad when you preach that you are one. 
As a matter of fact, in John 17, Jesus himself prayed that we would be one with him and the Father as he is with the Father. But you're not going to hear it preached very often. The Bible says, uh, when you come to the Lord, you're one spirit with him. You're not going to hear that. You're going to hear about sin. You're going to hear about guilt. You're going to hear about you're not doing very well. Well, all that stuff keeps you in a mindset of someone who doesn't have a pure heart, who cannot even enter the throne room of God to get what they want. So you've got to watch what you're listening to You've got to watch some things called Christian music. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody says, you listen to the Christian station? Not much. Right. I'd rather listen to secular. At least I know that's the devil speaking anyway, and I know where it's coming from. <laughs> and they're not trying to deceive me. Come on, they're not trying to sneak it in. It's, you know, yeah, baby, yeah, baby ain't going to hurt you usually. <laughs> but you a fool's going to hurt you. You a lowlife going to hurt you. You being Job going to hurt you. You being Peter denying the Lord's going to hurt you. All them things are going to hurt your mindset because it's easier to believe those than it is to believe that you're one with the Lord. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, the first thing you've got to understand, or you've got to make a decision on, am I a new creation when I got born again? First of all, are you born again? And if you are, am I a new creation? You either are a new creation, or you're not. If you don't believe that you are, you're going to spend the rest of your Christian life trying to become one. And if you do that, you're going to waste the rest of your life because you couldn't become one by yourself. You had to become one through what Jesus did on the cross. So you'll find a lot of people in the church on their way to becoming a new Christian, on their way to becoming righteous, on their way to becoming holy. But God already said you are holy. That's the new nature on the inside of you. Now when's my new nature going to manifest? When I'm in agreement with, how can two walk together if they're not in agreement? You're not even walking together with yourself. You're righteous on the inside, and you're a sinner in your mind, and you can't even walk in agreement with yourself. How are you going to walk in agreement with somebody else? Can't, certainly not God. So no, our mind has to be renewed again, doesn't it? Yes. To what God has done, how God sees us, what He does, so you have to make up our mind. Am I a new creation? Have old things passed away, or haven't they? Well, I'm working on my deliverance. Keep working. I'm going to get I'm going to get set free pretty soon. Okay, we'll see in 10 years. You know what you're going to say? I'm going to get free pretty soon because you've already been set free Amen. by the power of God and believing it is what allows the anointing of God to break that stuff off of your life once and for all. That's what it's there for. God does it all. We simply believe what he does. It's very simple. So old things have passed away. Alcoholism passed away. Anger slowly passed away. All these things in my life that I started catching when I believed I was a righteous man that didn't line up with righteousness, I started catching them. So I started talking to myself. Yes. Yes. Do you ever do that? Oh, how could you do that? That's not me. I don't do that. The righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not an angry man anymore. I don't get angry anymore. I'm sorry, everybody. I don't act that way anymore. I'm, I'm, that's not me, praise God. I'm a righteous man. Hallelujah. No, it wants a cuss word to slide out. Well, that's certainly not me. I don't do that anymore. I'd like to do it sometimes, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Feels good sometimes when I do it, but that's not it. So what? you've got to talk to yourself and tell yourself who you are, that you don't do those kind of things, do you see? And you'll come to a place where you won't get at you just you, The Bible says you can train your senses through the Word of God. So those emotions in you that used to rise up and want to tear everybody's face off will slowly get less and less and less until you don't react that way anymore. And all at once, a soft answer turns away wrath. When somebody's mad and screaming at you, just smile at them. Tell them how much you love them. See how that goes. You'll break that devil right out of there. I'll tell you what, he won't know what to say next. He'll come up with every foul thing he can think of. He'll call you every, you're the worst pastor in the world. You shouldn't even be a pastor. You ain't got no anointing. What are you doing, pastor? And I just, man, I love you. Amen. You are just the greatest person in the whole world. I'm so glad we know each other and we get along and everything. And it's no fun. See, they're, they're not making an effect on you, which they want to do. They're not getting in your mind because you already know who you are. You know, nobody can come, come up to you and tell you you're something that you're not this morning if you know who you are. Well, it's the same way this way. So you're righteous. So you're going to start acting like the Word. How does a righteous man act? Soft answer turns away wrath. He loves people. He never gets offended. Tell yourself that every morning. Hi, the man in the mirror never gets offended. Amen. Never walks in unforgiveness. Yeah, you right there in the mirror. Right there. You. You listening to me. Quit pointing back at me and listen to me. 
See, because you're the one making the transformation, but it comes through your mind. Spiritually, you've already been. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So we need to know who we are, what we can do, and what the Father even thinks of us. How many know that's important? Yes. All right. Praise God. Go to Colossians chapter 2. All right, look at verse 9. This is God speaking. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and what? Now notice what he says. You're not on your way to doing something. You are complete in Him. How did I get complete in Him? Did I struggle? Did I fight? Did I do my best? No. He made you complete in Him through a miracle of the new birth, the day that you got born again. You are now complete. Say complete. complete. Now we know what complete means. We are complete in Him. We're not halfway complete. We're not partway complete. We're not some way complete. You are complete in Him because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. So God sees you complete in Him. Amen. Amen. He says, there they are, another one complete in me. And then they walk around and complain about their sin and sickness and everything else the whole time and, and complain about this. Well, they'll slowly grow. We'll slowly grow out of that. It doesn't happen. You know, the spiritual rebirth was, was a miracle, wasn't it? But the mind renewal is not a miracle, is it? No, no, praise God. All right, go to Colossians chapter 1. Let's see what God says here. Look at verse 21. He says, in you, who's he talking to, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable, where? In his sight. So this tells you the whole thing. How did it happen? First of all, when did he reconcile you? Now. Say now. How many know now is now? Now is now, isn't it? Now is not tomorrow. He's not going to reconcile you tomorrow. So now, how did he do it? He did it through his death. Say through his death. Notice, he did not do it through your death. When we get to heaven, we'll be perfect and just like Jesus. Well, you will be, but you're perfect and just like Jesus now. The only problem is you don't know it. And you're not acting like it. So in God's sight, you're already perfect. You're already here, it says, holy and blameless in his sight. Now, the, the thing that really matters is, what am I in my sight? Is it like what in his sight? Hmm? Or is it like what's in my sight? So your sight and his sight are basically having a fight. See, and most of the time we're taught this is in the future, don't we? There's coming a day when you'll have peace. There's coming a day when you'll have joy. There's coming a day when everything will be fine. But that day was the day you got born again. And nobody wants to say that because we don't experience it and we're more in the sense realm, touch, feel, see, rather than what God's Word says. I mean, if God's Word does not get raised above on the inside of you of the natural, you'll never make the adjustment. See, there's always a spiritual and there's always a flesh sense battle. And most of us were born in the senses, raised in the senses, in the senses till we got born again. Then all at once there was a different report. And this report says, I'm healed when I don't feel good. My senses say, you're sick. Uh, my body says, I'm healed. Or my body says, I'm sick. But the Word says, I'm healed. No, I got, a tr I got trouble, don't you? Do you believe God? Yes. Are you healed? No, I'm sick. Well, God said you're healed. Amen. He never said you were sick. Are you following? So I have to renew my mind. And at first, it's tough, isn't it? Because your mind doesn't agree with it at all. You're having a fight. Holy, are you kidding me? Righteous, I should say not. Praise God. That's blasphemy. No, that's the Word of God. So our mind isn't being renewed. We're basically taught how we can struggle our way into the things that God already provided for us. And once again, you cannot pay for them with your currency. The only currency you can use in the kingdom is something called faith. Amen. Amen. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how many good deeds you got. I don't care how many times you go to church. It's simply faith in what Jesus has already done for you. It's the same thing as when you got born again. You didn't do a whole bunch of good stuff, and God finally looked down and said, Oh my God, i got to save that one. They're just doing so many good things. I can't believe I've overlooked them this long. No, He just sat there and waited for you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, already provided, you were already reconciled to God, and when you simply received Him, said, Thank you, Lord, bang, all at once there was a miracle done on the inside. Now we want to go back into the works. Remember the Galatians? Paul says, You started out in the gospel. Why are you going back? And, and my gosh, 
I'll tell you, the example that he used was a miracle worker. Did you become a miracle worker by the things that you did or by receiving the Spirit of God? But nobody wants to claim to be a miracle worker. Number one, we certainly can't be. And number two, if we do a miracle, it's only going to be one in a million that it was done. But if you believe you're a miracle worker, there is an absolute chance that you may start seeing... Uh, Amen. See, walk up to the next person you see who claims to be a Christian and say, I'm a miracle worker. What are you? <laughs> yeah, but he was, he, was, he was talking to the Galatians and he said, how did you become a miracle worker? Did you do it by all your works or did you do it by what Jesus did? Amen. And they didn't know what to say, like most churches now. They don't know what to say about it. Well, then I can believe I'm a miracle worker. Why? Because I am. Amen. I have God's nature on the inside of me, and I have the same spirit Hallelujah. that raised Christ from the... Hallelujah. Do I have the same one or a different one? Yeah. Now, I know he's getting older. <laughs> I know he's lost some of his power, and sometimes he can't hear you right, and he walks with a cane, but he can still do miracles. No, it's the same spirit, ain't it? And, I mean, he didn't have any problem raising Jesus up, and Jesus was, didn't have a sore toe. He didn't have a disease. He was dead. But the Spirit of God raised him, and God's trying to get across to us. That's who you are. You now possess the Spirit of God. You are spiritually possessed Amen. with the Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, if we teach people to get possessed with the Holy Ghost, they wouldn't get possessed with anything else. The devil can't put on you what God has already given you in there to fill it up, praise God, so it's not going to come out. But we preach the other way. You're no good. You're, you're led by the devil. You're a demonic person. You're, well, praise God, they already know that. But let's give them something to take the place. Do you see? Take the place. So we tell them who you are. You receive Jesus. Fill up with the Spirit of God. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Do those things. And the more filled up you get, they can't nothing get in you if you're filled up with God, for goodness sakes. So what's happening there? Here's God again. What's He saying? You are basically, praise God, holy. You are unblameable. And you are unreprovable in my sight. Now we're going to have to change our sight, aren't we? All right, go to Ephesians chapter 5. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Do you see that? Now, who's he talking about there? He's talking about us, isn't he? We want to put it off till after we die and go to heaven, don't we? When we die and go to heaven, then we're going to be holy and blemish. I'll tell you, if Jesus' work on the cross couldn't provide this for us, then what is going to? Is the Holy Ghost going to come down and die, and then the Father come down and die? No, no. It's already done. You already, according to God, you are holy and without blemish right now. And the reason why you're not looking that way is because you don't believe you're that way. You believe you're... A failure. You believe things aren't working out. You think you want to believe yourself, your actions, and other people rather than God. And it doesn't work that way. God knows. He made you. He knows what you're supposed to be like. He knows who you are. And you'll slowly transform in your mind. There'll be a renewing in there to a place where you start walking in these. You'll be not walking as someone holy, someone, someone who's blameless, someone who can come to the throne of God, someone who talks to God on a, without a thee and thou and all these things. Just talks to God for God's sakes. God's God. Praise God. He's a father. He's a daddy. And some people will say, well, I don't believe this will happen until after you die. Well, then God needed the devil's help to perfect you because Jesus couldn't do it. You're still all wrinkly. And since you're all wrinkly, the only time you're going to do it is when you die. And death isn't from Jesus. Death is from the. So the devil had to help Jesus finish his finished work so that you could get finished so you could go to heaven. Well, how many know that ain't true? The devil's not looking to help you. How many of you figured that out? Yeah. He's not there for you. So it's not when we die we do this stuff right now. We are holy and without blame before God right now. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ. We are righteous right now. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ. We are anointed right now with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are miracle workers. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ. Now that takes all, that takes all pride out of it. People say you're being prideful. That removes all the pride. The only time you have pride is when you did something to get to that place. Amen. Well, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Finally got there in righteousness. Yeah. Now I'm righteous. And you'll be righteous for about three hours and you'll cuss somebody out. 
<laughs> and then you'll think you're getting closer and just keep going. No, it has nothing to do with your works. It's all a free thing by the Lord Jesus Christ that was provided. And we're receiving these blessings. How many know being a miracle worker is a blessing? Being holy is a blessing. Being righteous is a blessing. You feel better when you're walking in holiness and righteousness. You feel better when you're not living in offense. See? And he knows that you operate better that way. So it's not him commanding you to do it because he's a, a taskmaster and a dictator. It's because it's the best way that you work. The car dealership will tell you to put oil in your car. They don't tell you that to demand you and dictate you. They tell you because your car needs oil, bless God. And if it don't have oil, it's not going to run right. Well, there's a lot of people out there in the church not running right. Because they're, oh, I ain't going to do that. I don't care if God demands that or not. Well, okay, then go right ahead. And when your wheel falls off, yep. come on, when you can't shift gears anymore, you'll know what's going on. He knows what's best for us, and He wants the best for us. It's a gospel of, of, of offer, basically. Not demand, but He's offering you. He offered you eternal life. He never demanded you had to get saved. And here's the thing, don't matter how much Jesus did, he went to the cross, he suffered, he died, he was nailed, his beard plucked out, he was stepped, he was killed, and all that stuff. Even when he was raised from the dead, he still can't make you get saved. He's done. He did everything that he could. Now he's just got to sit back and see who's going to receive it and who's not going to receive it. How many of you glad that you did? Yes. How many know there's a lot of people out there who haven't? Yes. And it's not because God's holding back from them because he doesn't like them because they know they just don't know about it and they're not doing it. So then he offers you the anointing. Well, that's for the pastors. Oh, thank God for those anointed pastors. No, no. You're anointed. Amen. The Bible says you have an anointing of God and you know all things. Yeah. I don't know nothing. I'm spiritually stupid. Well, no, you're not. The Bible says you know all things. Why? Because the knower lives on the inside of you. And when you start believing that the knower is in there, the knower will go to work when you need to know something. Amen. Well, I don't know everything. Well, you'll know something when you need it. You don't need to know everything today. Maybe what you want to eat for lunch. That's as far as you need to go today, praise God, right now. Don't stress yourself out. That's right. Don't cheat. <laughs> yeah, so all these things are already on the, God's wisdom's on the inside of us. God's righteousness is in us. We are, we not even our righteousness, we're the righteousness of God Himself, praise God. When we go into the throne room, it's just like Jesus going into the throne room. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has past tense blessed us with all spiritual blessings and gifts in heavenly places in Christ, according as He has chosen us in Him. Who chose you? Jesus. Notice, when did He chose you? Before the foundation of the... He didn't choose you the day that you got saved. He chose you and had to wait for you to choose Him. So according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that you should be a sinner, rotten, stinky, and look at him as a holy, wonderful God, and you just smell. No, that you should be holy and without blame before him, where? In love. He did this. He didn't do this the day you even got saved. He didn't do it the day you after got saved. He had this before the foundation of the world that his kids were going to end up in this position to be holy and blameless, and he was going to provide the reason why they got there, and he was going to provide the work that needed to be done be finished there. So this isn't something God was just, well, should I save this one? Shouldn't I save that one? He's not thinking that. He's wondering if somebody's going to get a clue and get born again because it's already sitting there. It's like a spiritual buffet. Yeah. We all understand buffets, don't we? Oh, yes. Yeah. You got healing here and you got holiness there and righteousness here and you got your big old plate and you're going through there and putting stuff on. Glory to God. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm going to take some of that holiness today. I'll take a little bit of righteousness today. Ooh, there's that anointing. Woo -hoo. Take a big chunk of that. And yeah, it all belongs to us. We are in the receiving process of it, not the getting of it or the paying for it or anything else. It's already been provided by Him. All right, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again. Now, one thing I found in my own life that this has changed in my thought life is when I pray, I expect it to get done. Have you ever prayed when you didn't expect it to get done anyway? Yeah. yeah. See? You just didn't expect it. You say, oh, God, well, let me throw a prayer out there, see if it sticks on the wall. God help them. <laughs> didn't work. Try to do something for them. <laughs> well, I prayed for them. Yeah, I did. I prayed for them. 
me. But there, there's something that comes when you know your righteousness with God. You expect God to do what he said he already did or is going to do because you're on that level of playing with him. It's like a, a spouse and a husband. If your wife comes to you and, and asks you to do something, most of the time we do it within the next three months. <laughs> Thank God God's quicker. <laughs> but we do do it. We do hear you. And we're on the same level. And we'll do it. And it's the same way, vice versa. I just said that to make you women happy this morning. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So, I mean, we're with him now. We're expecting. We know, we know, what, we know what he said. We're going to do the same works Jesus did in greater works. I didn't say that. He said that. I didn't make that up. He made that up. Praise God. He said it. He told me to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He told me to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He told me to cast out devils. He told me to pray in tongues. He told me, don't worry if I eat anything. It's no good. My body will kick it out. I'll be, I'll be fine. See? And, and what this does, it drives fear out. Yeah. Christ fear out. And it does it the other way. If you know Satan's defeated and you're the one who basically was with Jesus when he got defeated because he was your substitute, then the devil's defeated and his works. Is sickness one of his works? Yeah. Worry one of his works? Yeah. Fear one of his works? Yeah. So all these works basically, I'm not f afraid of him anymore. I have authority over those things anymore. So you don't have to walk around afraid. And Oh, they sneezed over there. I'm going to sit over here in church this day because I mean, I hope that sneeze don't fly that far and get on me over here. But once again, that's the way we were brought up, right? Come on, that's the way we... Stay away, stay away from me. Stay away from me. I used to do that at the prayer meeting. These older women would come in all the time and they'd sit way in the corner and go... Shh. And then we'd do the hug-a-thon and I'd come back, stay away from me. And I'd just grab them and I'd just hold them and shake them and... You're not afraid of that. Do you see? You're not afraid of that stuff anymore. Why? Because you know you've got rulership over that stuff now. Praise God. You know who you are and who he's made you. It's your holy and blameless. Praise God. And you're taking Jesus' place in the earth. And what would Jesus do? Would he run from somebody that sneezed? Would he run from somebody that has leprosy? No. Why? He had a righteous mindset. Now, his was a little easier. How many of you know that? Because he didn't have to recall any sins that he did. Because he didn't did any sins. <laughs> But we in the old days did some sins, didn't we? We did some stupid things. That's why his blood was strong enough to justify us just as if I never sinned. That's the way Jesus walked. Free from sin, free from any kind of sin mentality, sin consciousness, evil heart, evil consciousness. And he just went and did the Father what the Father wanted done. Well, then he got us all born again, got us to a place where he could send the Holy Ghost. He says, when I go up, I'm going to send somebody down. And when they come down, you're going to continue the works that I was doing here in the earth. Can you get a hold of that? You're taking his place right now. You're taking Jesus' place right now. You're the one who's going to have to do the things that Jesus started to do in destroying the works of the devil. The church is going to have to do that. It's got to stop becoming just a social club where everybody gets together and teaches what they want to teach and keep out what you don't because it might offend somebody. If you get offended in here, it's part of the devil chasing you around you need to get rid of. See? And in your own life, you're going to fight this in your, because you've been trained, you've been, you've been conformed, basically, to this world. And some of this stuff's going to sound like far out stuff to you. I mean, it sounded like far out stuff to me the first time I heard it. I picked up a book, man, it was by E.W. Kenyon. I mean, I love his teachings. And I read his book, my gosh, and it started talking about me healing the sick. I was trying to find out how to get healed. I am the sick. I said, this guy's nuts. <laughs> It's supposed to tell me how to get healed, not to go around healing people. Telling me, cast out devils. Telling me to do this. Telling me if you're not doing this, you're not really fulfilling your purpose here anyway. You might as well go to heaven and get it over with. I thought, this guy's got some gall. <laughs> and then I found out that he instructed a church of about 220 some people. And he taught this and taught this stuff and taught it. And he had 220 people that never got sick. Amen. Never had those kind of problems because they rose up into a mindset of who they were in Christ Jesus and they started ruling and reigning in their own lives and the lives of their relation and the lives of the people around them. And when you went to somebody in the church to get prayer, let me tell you what, you got prayer. Yeah. You didn't get this. <laughs> no, you didn't get the hand. You got actual prayer before the Father. Pray, Hey God, you said this. You said this about Brother Joe. Praise God. It's right there in your book. Praise God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. He's healed from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. God said, ooh, ooh. Thank God somebody's playing the game with me. And see, you think God wants you healed? 
Yes. Does, don't he? You think he wants you operating in the power of God? Yes. You think he wants the works of the devil destroyed? <laughs> yeah, these are all things God wants. But he can't do it anymore. He's up there. Jesus is up there. So he gave the earth. Who did he put in charge of the earth? Man. That's what he created man for. Man to be in control of the earth. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and everything on the earth. But we want to, oh, I don't know if I have any authority. Well, when you're righteous, you naturally got authority. Yeah. See? So we're backing up. We're not trying to have authority. You can't be sinful minded and think that you have authority because when you walk in front of the devil, first of all, you're going to be scared. See? You're going to be all mixed up. You're going to be all messed up, basically. So that righteous mindset gives you a boldness. The righteous are bold as a... So you run into a problem. It's no longer, oh, no, what am I going to do? It's let me take care of this situation for you. Because it changed your thought life, didn't it? It changed who you are. I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ. I now have the power of attorney from heaven, praise God. I can do whatever Jesus would do. Even though he's up there, I'm down here. So it's the same authority. That's why we do it in his name. We're operating in the name of Jesus, praise God. So we want to start living that way. How many of you are going to be a shining light you start living this way? Because there are a lot of other people that need that. And you're going to see a lot of things happening. You're going to see people healed. You're going to see people set free. And those people are going to catch fire. And this is the way it's going to go. Revival is an everyday thing. Revival should be going on right now. Let's not be a church that sits back till the revival comes in April of 2024. Or October 17th of 2026. Or whenever the next one's prophesying the revival to come. Why not be a revival today when you go to the restaurant? Why not be a revival when you go to your job next week? Why not get somebody born again and delivered then? Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. And then when revival comes, go to it and add to it. Yeah. Don't suck it dry because you're so dry. You need to get something out of it. Praise God. That's why people go to revival because they're drowning. They're dying in the world. And thank God they go. But you shouldn't have to go for that. Praise God. You shouldn't have to hunt one down. We should be walking and living this way. This is kingdom living. Glory to God. And it belongs to each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Okay, we're going to have to do this very quickly here. 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 21. It says, For he, talking about Jesus, or if God has made him Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So this tells you here basically that he made Jesus to be sin. Say be sin. Now notice, he did not just take your sins, he became sin itself. So he took all the sin of the world basically. And when he did that, it made you when he was raised from the dead that you could be made. Say made. made. Say it again, made. made. Notice, not become righteous, but be made righteous. So when you got born again, you were made righteous. You are the righteousness of God, God's righteousness in Christ Jesus. The Bible says your old sins are as far as the east is from the west. Your sins are in the depths of the sea and you can't find them. Your sins were blotted out on the cross and they are gone forever. So don't bring them up anymore unless you're showing the work of Jesus. I was this way, but be, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Now I'm this way. Don't keep complaining about, oh, that's just the way I always am. That's just the way I do things. That's just how our family does things. That's how we always did stuff. That's who we were. That's what we do. No, no, that's not who you are anymore. You started all over. December 21st, 1985, 7 o'clock in the evening on a, on a night, my whole life changed. I was this person, and when I walked out of that place, I was a different person, praise God. And so I knew something was, was there, and there was a hunger for the Word, and I got in the Word. And I tell you, you'll never get to this place if you don't get a hunger for the Word. You can't do it. It's only the Word of God that does this thing. It's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll cut that old man completely off of you. You want to talk about being circumcised. That's, that's what Paul said. He said, circumcision for the Jews, all right. But you've been circumcised. The old man's been chopped off of you and kicked to the side, and you're a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. But everybody in the church wants to, wants to carry around the foreskin of the old man. Come on, they don't even do that. They're smarter than that. No, you throw the thing away, for gosh sakes. So we're throwing the thing away, too. We're not carrying it around the whole time. And Well, that's just the way I am. That's the way everybody says I am. That's what they say. This is it. This is it. No, you have passed from life to death. You have become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. That's who your nature is. And I'll tell you what. When you, until you get this revelation, you're always going to struggle with sickness and disease. Yep. You're always going to struggle with failure. You're always going to struggle with the things of life because you're going to see them as mountains and you as this little person down here trying to control things. But when you get into righteousness, you're going to rise above these things. You're going to see the devil is defeated and underneath your feet because that's where he is. You don't even have to defeat him anymore. He's already defeated. You just enforce the defeat that he already got 
Come on, through Jesus, sickness and disease has no right. No right to get in your body. No right to try to get in. No right to get in there. No right to mess you up. you got the same Spirit of God on the inside of you that's quickened, making alive, and strengthened my mortal body today. Praise God. He's flowing through my blood veins right now. There he goes. Oh, yeah. Praise God. There he is. Hallelujah. And what's he do? He keeps us healed. Keeps us whole. Keeps these things. And I know if, if we have something wrong with... The tendency is to talk about it all the time. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Well, my bursitis. My diabetes. My thing. My this. My my that, my this. Well, it's not yours to begin with if you're born again. It's somebody else's. And they put it on you, praise God, because it doesn't belong to you. Everything you get should come from God, and He's not handing out bursitis. That's right. He's certainly not in the diabetes business. See? So what are we doing? We're claiming all these stuff because the doctor tells us. The doctor tells you you're sick, and Jesus tells you you're healed. Which one you're going to believe? It's totally up to you. <laughs> See? It's the word of the Lord, praise God. we got to be word people. But now if you don't know what Jesus said, then it's going to be awful hard to believe what Jesus says. But we know. We have this book right here. We know what to believe. We know it belongs to us. And now we're going to have to start standing in that thing. And, and there's, there's some miracle workers rising up on the inside in here, praise God, in their thought life. There are some people that are casting out devils more than they never have before because it's rising up in their thought life. You're going to lay hands and you're going to see some people here. Why? It's rising up in your thought life here, praise God. The only thing keeping it from happening is the way you think right now. It's not, well, God won't God. God did God. Yes, He did. And it's already been provided for each and every one of us. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. When did you want to come up yet, you said? Let me pray for you first. Can I do that? I just feel you need some prayer today. Some of you are at the stop sign. I want to turn the light green. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the anointing in this place this morning. I thank you that you always follow the word with your spirit and the power of God. And right now, I thank you for the word that went forth. Holy Ghost, I ask you to rise up on the inside of every single person who heard this word this morning. I thank you for going into the, the deepness of their mind and cutting out things that they've been saying all the time, things that they've been thinking. I thank you that it will, will be a, a witness to them on the inside as you walk with them daily, telling them what needs to be changed, what words they're saying that need to be changed, the thoughts that need to be changed. And I thank you, Father. Fathers, they cast down every thought and every imagination that exalts themselves against your word. I thank you that the change will continue in a rapid pace. I thank you for the anointing in each and every one of us, and, and your spirit is the greatest teacher in the world. And I thank you for what you're doing in this place and in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, 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 amen. amen.